Of course, then people ask, oh, yes, 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 but why would they do it? Why is all of this Muslim, multicultural, political correctness thing happening to us right now? It's happening because we no longer have an enemy. Tourists today can visit what used to be the Eastern Bloc, and they can photograph the derelict, rusting heap of scrap metal, which used to be the Soviet war machine. It has gone, and this has created an unprecedented political situation which the world has never seen before, in which there is only one superstate, the Anglo-American Alliance. No other power on Earth today is capable of fighting a war on the grand scale. China, North Korea, Russia simply do not have the economic resources. So in order to make us believe we still have an enemy, and therefore have to live in fear, the rich had to provide us with a new enemy. And this is why in recent years they've encouraged unstable Islamic people to emigrate to the West. It's to provide us with a ready-made enemy. This is their master plan for this single superstate age. And it's for this reason that they perverted political correctness to make people believe that anybody who refuses to go along with this new doctrine of multiculturalism is the worst person of all. In the West today, we've become quite used to seeing confrontations between the alleged lunatic fringe of Islam and indigenous white men who are trying to defend their culture from foreign influences. What groups like the EDL do not understand, however, is who is really pulling the strings here? Who is behind this? Who arranged this fight? Because any Roman senator would tell you this is simply the old maxim of divide and rule. The Romans invented this system. They always made sure that every conquered region pushed together tribes who were traditionally hostile to one another. The British copied this method after World War I by redrawing the entire map of the Middle East to make sure that the new boundaries always set one Arab tribe against another, particularly the Kurds. What we see on the streets of Britain and America today is the same thing. The whole idea is that while you're fighting against Muslims, and they're fighting against you, no one has the time to stop and think about who actually created this situation and who their real enemy really is. The rulers of the Middle Ages arranged a never-ending religious war between Catholic and Protestant for precisely the same reason. Now, why must we always think we have an enemy? Because the ruling group always maintain their position in society by controlling the population through fear. Think about it. If we don't have an enemy, would the public be prepared to pay for the army? Would we be happy to pay for MI5 so that they can read our emails and put a surveillance camera on every street corner? Big Brother has to have an excuse for watching us all, all the time. And what they call national security is always the perfect excuse. The moment you make a world at peace, it's gone. The keystone in the arch of ruling class power is gone if we don't have an enemy. So the rich are always going to provide us with an enemy forever. And the lesson we need to learn from all of this is that everything in our lives is and always has been a rich man's trick. When people think of ancient Rome, they always tend to think about the gladiators in the Roman arena. But something people don't realize is that Roman amphitheatres were a scam. They were perhaps the very first big confidence trick in human history, played by more cunning rich men upon a naive public. What Caesar did was to say to the Roman Vulgate, I will give you gladiatorial gains, but only if I can have your votes. And he only offered this bargain because he knew the Vulgate loved the games more than they loved anything. This is how the Roman maxim Panem et Circenses, bread and circuses, became established. Because Caesar was the first politician to understand that if you give people what they want, they will tolerate being ruled. 
By this means, Julius Caesar made himself into the first dictator whose fortune was protected by a professional army. And everything that every ruler has given us since Caesar has simply been another rich man's trick. Religion is a rich man's trick. It was invented because wealthy rulers realized the population was getting too big for soldiers to watch over constantly. So, they replaced the idea of having many gods with one single god, a simple idea simple men could understand, who could see what everyone was doing all the time. The idea of one god became the surveillance video of the ancient world. In the Middle Ages, the same sort of people grew rich by charging people for the forgiving of sins. And when a new age dawned with the coming of Industrial Revolution, they invented new tricks to control the population explosion like censorship. Every grown-up knows that there is one law for the rich and one law for the rest, because the justice system is a rich man's trick. Mafia godfathers like Sam Giancana walked free from American criminal courts over and over again by taking the Fifth Amendment because it is a criminal's law. And it's the same with everything else. The media is a rich man's trick. The tax system, because the rich never pay any tax, is a rich man's trick. Political correctness is a rich man's trick. The murder plot to kill Lady Diana Spencer was a rich man's trick. And the war on terror, 9-11, the London tube bombings, the Woolwich terror attack, the Kennedy assassination, all of it is simply another rich man's trick controlling how we think. Now, once again, it is very easy at this point to imagine the reaction of conservative politicians who will, of course, try to laugh this off and scoff. Everything is a rich man's trick. Are we seriously suggesting that the Cold War was a rich man's trick? Now, in your research and analysis and your efforts to bring out the facts about what was going on in our society, did you encounter any effort to discourage you, to prevent you from bringing out the background of America's involvement in the financing of international communism? Yes, very definitely. Um, for example, uh, when I was at the Hoover Institution, uh, in 1972, I went to Miami Beach to give some testimony before the um, Republican National Committee. And uh, although a congressman had hand-delivered to the wire services this testimony, which was later printed, uh, the wire services refused to transmit it to the newspapers. Then when I got back to the Hoover Institution um, in California, um, I was called into the office of the director and... Um, I was told in no uncertain terms not to make any more speeches like that and that this information should not be made public. This was the information that we were giving the Soviet Union the technology to develop its war potential? Oh, yes. At that time, we were, in, we were in Vietnam. And as you know, the Soviets were supplying the North Vietnamese. This was 1972? 1972, yes. And, uh, for example, I knew that the Gorky plant, which was built by the Ford Motor Company, but the Gorky plant in Russia produces the gas, a series of vehicles. The gas vehicles had been seen on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We were supplying equipment to the Gorky plant. In the middle of the Vietnamese war, and these trucks were being used to carry ammunition supplies, which were killing Americans. So I thought this was morally wrong, and I said so at Miami Beach and at the Hoover Institution. And it was this type of information uh, that was suppressed. The rich would much rather we didn't think at all, and certainly not about the wise words of the columnist Claire Rayner, who once famously said that the only reason we now have to live under kings and queens and presidents is that in past ages their ancestors were the best thieves. In the Middle Ages, when the king was feeling greedy and wanted to pay for a new mistress or grand new palace, he simply sent out his robber barons to steal half the herd of every local farmer. And if they complained, the robber barons would say the king needed to feed the army or some similar excuse. That is how it was done then. But today, the ruling class face a different problem. We now live in an industrial...